Hello, everyone, and welcome to the panel on Transitional Justice for the United States. Can Transitional Justice Tools Help the United States Address a Legacy of Racial Injustice? This panel is being pre-recorded, but we invite you to continue the conversation with the button at the bottom of your screen. We will have some live participation of um, the, the panelists, and so we can continue discussing these issues uh, in the chat function. The concept of transitional justice refers to a range of measures, judicial, non-judicial, formal, informal, retributive, and reconciliatory, that may be employed by societies in response to a legacy of authoritarianism or mass violence following some period of political transition. The goals animating the field of transitional justice are as varied as they are ambitious. They encompass promoting accountability for gross and systemic violations of human rights, preventing a recurrence of such violations, rebuilding social coherence, rehabilitating victims, restoring trust in formerly abusive institutions, et cetera. Transitional justice practitioners draw from a toolkit of mechanisms that respond in various measures to these objectives and that are susceptible to localization and to adaptation within particular societies. These tools can relate to everything from trials, both civil and criminal, truth commissions, the vetting of perpetrators, reparation devoted to the rehabilitation of victims, the memorialization of suffering and of survival, and systemic legal and institutional reforms. And as we now know, these various interventions can be layered and sequenced in different ways so that they complicate, or in some cases can actually comp can, can complement each other. Transitional justice efforts have long been associated with events elsewhere, as states in Latin America, Eastern Europe, parts of Africa, and Asia have emerged from periods of repression or conflict. This discourse, however, has rarely been applied to the United States. Indeed, when some, some civil rights and civil liberties advocates began to discuss the possibility of turning a transitional justice lens on the United States to address injustices that were perpetrated during the United States response to the attacks of September 11th, there was very steep resistance within some circles with one member of Congress really rejecting the parallel that was being made between, for example, apartheid South Africa and the United States. But once more, we are hearing calls for the United States to look to the field of transitional justice to address historical racial injustices going all the way back to the founding of our nation and that continue to have impacts today, including systemic racism and anti-blackness, um, racial discrimination and contemporary racial violence in policing. Our panel today has a terrific mix of experts in the field of transitional justice and also practitioners leading efforts to promote racial justice here in the United States. We, again, occur you to continue this conversation by pressing the button below, but we'll go to our um, panelists now to make some introductory remarks. Then we'll have more of a conversation about these topics, and we look forward to your questions in the chat. So, Pablo, I hope we can start with you. Could you discuss a little more about the different tools within the Transitional Justice Toolkit and the objectives um, that are underlying them when they're deployed within transitional states and how they might be used here in the United States? Thank you, Beth, and uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, everyone for the invitation and to say that I'm honored uh, to share the panel with uh, my distinguished uh, co-panelists. Uh, so a few things about uh, uh, the field and its uh, tools. As you mentioned in your introductory remarks, uh, transitional justice uh, has uh, become the name for efforts that countries uh, have implemented in order to deal with legacies of violations or abuses. And for a long time now, there has been a consensus about uh, four main elements in a comprehensive transitional justice policy. One of them being uh, truth, uh, which can be established uh, through different means, criminal justice, reparations, and uh, a collection of a uh, very broad collection of measures under the general heading of guarantees of non recurrence, which are basically preventive measures in order to try to diminish the likelihood that the violations will take place again. If you think about the Latin American countries of the Southern Cone, as the place where that understanding of transitional justice took place. That means that in a relatively short period of time, in about 40 years, transitional justice has achieved some quite significant gains. It has, of course, contributed to giving content to each of the corresponding rights, the right to truth, 
to justice, to reparations, and to guarantees of non-recurrence. It has done it not just in theory, doctrinally, but in practice, which I think is very important. And through the implementation of the four measures, comprehensively, holistically, it doesn't mean simultaneously, but it means in relationship to one another, not as a random collection of initiatives, but rather as elements of a comprehensive whole. I think that the measures have contributed to giving recognition to victims and not just in terms of the pain that they have endured, but to recognize them as rights holders, which I think is absolutely fundamental. It has contributed to strengthening civic trust, trust between citizens in divided societies and trust between them and the uh, state institutions. I think that transitional justice has made a contribution to strengthening the rule of law in places in which it was broadly either conceived or in fact put into practice the idea that the law is only for some and not for others, usually for the privileged and not to the benefit of the privileged and the disadvantaged of the others. It has given a sense of equality to societies that implemented the norms And finally, it has made a contribution to a basic form of social cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, some people call that reconciliation, but at the very same, at the very least, uh, at the sense that we can live with one another with a minimum element of uh, trust. In the successful cases, I think that arguably these are effects uh, that uh, have taken place amongst others. Great, thank you very much. Galu, I'd like to turn to you. With your work with Asia Justice and Rights, you've worked with a number of transitional justice processes in Asia. Could you talk a little bit about what lessons might be learned for advocates for racial justice here in the United States from some of the efforts that you've worked on? Sure, um, I just wanna say that we actually have a common root cause, which is colonialism. And I would say it's biological and ideological father of slavery. So there's so much actually unexamined uh, impact of colonialism that we in Asia, we are so much of our protected conflicts from Myanmar to Sri Lanka to Indonesia, Timor-Leste have roots in this um, situation of you know, when there was a hierarchy of pigmentation created it back way, way back then, and it's been recreated and recycled, internalized, ethnicized, engendered through our own histories till today. Um, and, you know, I'm re also really glad that we're meeting to talk about this in terms of us, you know, people who are t thinking about how to how to make changes, social justice change, when actually the perpetrators are also looking at each other. So the uh, the um, attack of the Capitol on the 6th of February, I believe was very much in the eyes of the military junta in Myanmar and they actually pulled it off. They said, oh, we can just say an election was fraud and then send off the military. So in real time in Asia, we are still, Um, experiencing this and and that's been I think one of the key lessons in Asia has been the um, return uh, of the military men uh, from Thailand, Myanmar and in, in Indonesia context has been you know they're not returning as military but they're changing their clothes as civilians. Mm -hmm. So that's that is our challenge in terms of this long and protracted sort of impunity, entrenched impunity in the region. But having said that, we are using the tools of um, transitional justice. There's been many truth commissions, a few hybrid courts, war crime courts, a very little reparations. Um, in South Korea, there was a truth commission in Thailand, in Timor-Leste, in Aceh, in Nepal. Uh, there are all these um, situations. We are starting to, uh, we are using these tools, but it is also a challenge because the um, forces are pushing back. And I think one of the key lessons for you guys in America is that uh, whatever tools you use, you have to um, make use of 
its public education potential so that there are more people who join your bus. You know, at the end of your mechanism, you have more people who understand the impact uh, of racism, the impact of um, slavery, and more um, empath there's more empathy from the, the general public. If at the end you have more people who are uh, who don't understand and don't care, then there is, you know, you really need to work on that participation part of of your mechanisms. Um, in Asia, we are in situations where there's so many blockages. So we work on local level, national level, you know, provincial level. Uh, it's a little bit of a dance, and so you know, a little so. You, I think one of the things, uh, you know, do you work on community level or do you also look at national? I think you, you need to do both. And when you run out of steam at one level, then you get energized uh, to each other. Um, you really need to make sure that you choose good people, that there's a process that you can choose good people to be inside your mechanisms. Because if you end up with very bureaucratic, uh, uh, sort of narrow-minded people, then you can have a, a situate a TJ tool that is just doesn't produce anything. Um, and it can be very frustrating for survivors. And I think, you know, my last point around this is whatever you do, whatever TJ tool you use, the most important piece is the long term engagement with survivors and allowing them to articulate their issues for them to be empowered and participate in the processes and letting them to be the guide of the sort of the next choices. Because, you know, TJ Tools is not a magical formula that abracadabra, if you have a truth commission or if you have a serious crimes court, if you have, then change will happen. It, it's not, and we cannot promise that to the survivors, to the victims, because that's not how it works. But it can be a door to transformation um, and the key to that is the participation. So uh, I also want to say that um, we at Ajia, we wrote a paper called 20 Lessons from 20 Years of Transitional Justice in Asia. So there's sort of those 20 lessons are in this in there. Perfect. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Gail, I'd love to turn to you. You were instrumental in launching the U.S. Truth Racial, Racial Healing and Transformation Movement. Could you talk a little bit about the origins of that movement and what you see as the main goals? Certainly. And again, let me thank my fellow panelists and say what an honor and privilege it is to be with all of you. The truth, racial healing and transformation effort really began over a decade ago. Uh, it's the only effort of its type globally that was spawned by philanthropic organizations. It was really the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and it was the demographic imperative initially that drove the work. Uh, we invested for about five years in an effort we called America Healing. And uh, it was sort of a laboratory for us to, to, to work with the major civil rights organizations, human rights organizations, community-based efforts, and learn as much as we could about how change happens in this country in terms of overcoming racism. Now, when I said demographic imperative, basically I was referring to the fact that most of the children in this country today are children of color. And an overwhelming number of these children are living in impoverished or low income situations. So if you just stretch that out, ultimately it's in our best collective interest as a country to eliminate the barriers to the mm -hmm. success of most of our nation's children. And so that allowed us to design an approach that aligned with our mission as a foundation at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, because our focus was on children. So we invested hundreds of millions of dollars over that five years and evaluated our work. And so around 2016, we recognized, and it was really inspired by the Canadian effort, it would have been the first effort in this hemisphere at scale to do truth and reconciliation. And so we said, well, you know, America has never done at scale a national truth and reconciliation effort. So let us capture the lessons that we learned, build on that. And we knew we had to call it truth. We felt like racial healing was an important frame for us rather than reconciliation, because we wanted folks to acknowledge the tremendous harm that's associated with 400 years of believing in a hierarchy of human value of building a country on an ethos 
that essentially devalues some people and values others. So we wanted to acknowledge the harm and recognize that healing had to happen. But most importantly, the systems of injustice must be transformed. So we created a framework which has five key components. You may hear some of the TJ components in it, but the first one is narrative change. We know that we're dealing with shifting a culture, a mindset, a belief system that's embedded in every communications vehicle from the school systems to the mass media, unfortunately now to the social media. So we knew that the narrative component was critical because what we're really changing are the minds as well as the hearts and the systems. So narrative change is the, is the overriding sort of first uh, pillar of the work. And then we do what we call the racial healing and relationship building, building on the literature that, that talks about how do you overcome bias? How do you connect people at a heart level? How do you uproot this fallacy that we are, can be grouped in a taxonomy of humanity? And, some, and that work has to be done at the community level with people. And so we have uh, over a thousand people that have been trained to do this work in circles, in communities. And then we ask the simple question, if racial hierarchy is a lie, how has it been maintained for four centuries? What are the mechanisms of sustaining racial hierarchy? And we came up with three key pillars for that. In America, it's through separation, legal entrenched, separation, everything from the cradle to prison pipeline, to the foster care system, to residential segregation, we have built systems of separation. And so we knew that we had to undo those mechanisms if we're gonna undo racism. The other mechanism of maintaining racial hierarchy of which the public is more aware now because of the cell phone and video cameras, but the other mechanism is the legal system, the criminal justice system, as well as the civil legal system in this country, what has been imbued and it is, in, it is a mechanism for maintaining racial hierarchy. And then ultimately from slavery to the dispossession of the indigenous people to the immigration laws and the lack there of them, it's the economics. So we have five pillars of the work, narrative change, racial healing, separation, the law and the economy. And so it's that framework which is broad enough to allow to encourage local communities to adapt it in ways that make sense for them. Uh, I'll close by saying what we didn't want to do was to create a bunch of commissions and talking heads and re-traumatization and victimization. We begin the work in every community with a process of visioning a future America without racism. A future America that has faced its past and committed to overcoming it, to being responsible for it. So you see the, the, the reparations component can fit in the economy, right? The criminal justice reform can fit in the law. All of the major changes that we have to make in terms of housing and residential placement can fit under separation. But we're trying to build a critical mass of people who understand how necessary this work is. And we do that through the relationship building and through the, uh, the narrative change. And Senator, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Senator Cory Booker get it. They like the idea and they said, we think we need a national effort. And that's how we have come to create this national movement, trying to get it to be legislated so that we can put resources into communities to continue the work. Thank you very much. That's a terrific segue to Rob. Rob, as your role of, of community liaison, um, with the Racial Justice Coalition. Can you talk a little bit about how you're thinking about some of these transitional justice ideas, but in the communities in which you're working in Asheville, North Carolina and elsewhere? Yes, ma'am. Um, first, I would like to say it's, it's an honor to be sharing space uh, with these thought leaders. Um, I agree with, with everything that's been stated. And so, uh, you know, some of the things that, that we look into, that there are several different concepts uh, that transitional justice uh, has that that we are looking to get implemented, and the first one, of course, is is truth and reconciliation, and then also reparations. Whereas we've been able to get a resolution. So again, the concepts that that, that I'm looking at when you when you take a look at uh, the truth and reconciliation process, um, 
I think we are a little bit beyond individual reconciliation and interpersonal reconciliation. Um, we're at the socio-political reconciliation and the institutional level of reconciliation. Where we're talking about uh, disenfranchisement from politics and policies that have uh, pretty much put us in an environment of de facto segregation. Um, and then you have the institutional rec uh, reconciliation which again is like uh, the institutional racism that we face, whether it's uh, inside the healthcare system or inside the educational system. And, you know, and then you take a further look and it's like, you know, what type of reconciliation, thin or thick? And I, I can see aspects from both, but I really feel as if we need thick uh, reconciliation. And, but before that, we definitely need the truth, which creates the environment, like what Ms. Gale was speaking on where it changes the narrative. Because for so long, the narrative of why things are the way they are has been constructed to benefit the, uh, the entities and individuals that, that created that environment. And um, you know, changing the narrative on these things are so important because then when you get to the reconciliation and reparations part, individuals don't look at it as charity. Unless you correct that narrative, Individuals look at it as if the individuals that uh, receive this quote unquote special attention are receiving some form of charity and they don't see it as justice. So it's like you have to do deep education around the histories. You know, I'm looking at five different pillars within my work uh, that are that are more direct to to what it is that, that I'm trying to repair uh, economic mobility where you have the disenfranchisement, you have the disparities in governmental contracting. You have the, uh, you know, the banking institutions not being willing to lend a bankroll to to uh, provide workflow, work, uh, working capital. And then you have the healthcare institution where there's been all types of deaths that have occurred. There have been, uh, you know, several different instances of situations with experiment with experimentation, uh, like, you know, the syphilis experiment and the Tuskegee, the Tuskegee, Tuskegee experiment and several mm -hmm. other things. Then you have the educational, uh, the educational system, you know, where even after integration, uh, we were still very much excluded and they included our bodies into that system, but took our teachers out. And then you have implicit bias and you have disciplinary procedures. And there's like, there's no accountability. There's nobody uh, keeping track of these things. Then you have the, uh, the justice system and, and, you know, there are so many things that, that need to be corrected within that. And um, you also have an environmental justice piece. And um, I view it as each of these pillars need their own specific reparations. And so, like I said, there are several different concepts from, from a transitional justice that we are looking to implement. Uh, one of them definitely being the beginning is truth and reconciliation, and then digging in and uh, creating a unique version of reparations to repair the things uh, that have been wrong. And for me, one of the most important pieces of the reparations piece itself is actually stopping uh, the harms that, that, that are going on. Uh, that's, that should be the first step. And so we're currently trying to identify all these policies and create policies to counteract policies that have uh, caused the harm and level of oppression within these multiple systems. And um, Yes, yeah, it's, it's just a it's a it's a long process. I look at transitional justice as as the middle game on this chessboard, and the end game is is where we actually move into the solutions thereof, and we are getting rid of some of the disparities. We are lessening the generational wealth gap. We are uh, decreasing the the achievement slash opportunity uh, gap. We are counteracting the social determinants of health. We are. Um, we are lessening mass incarceration for people of color and every other disparity was that, that, are, that is within all of the systems that, that I just named. But transitional justice, I think, is uh, you know, the different concepts unique to our situation are, are probably uh, one of the most important places to start at because that narrative change is just, is just so very important to even receive buy-in and momentum to do the things that need to be done to address these situations. Thank you for that. Um, implicit in many of your comments has been this question of scale, um, whether or not we need a national response or a subnational or even more local response to what we see uh, in terms of racial injustices around us. 
many historical um, and international instances of transitional justice around the world have involved responses at the national level that are conceived and then implemented by a transitional or a national unity or even a post-transition government. In the United States, to the extent that we have had what would we might consider transitional justice responses, they've tended to be more localized. I'm thinking, for example, of the Truth Commission in Maine to address the abduction of native children from their families so that they could be raised in, in white environments. Reparations in Rosewood to respond to the 1923 massacre and similarly nascent efforts in Tulsa to respond to the 1920 massacre. I guess the reparations for the Japanese internment is a notable exception, but I'm wondering if, if and I'll, I'll just open this to the whole, the whole panel, um, given the sheer size of the United States and the cumulative injustice to date, is this too much to address at a national level or should we be thinking more about more localized efforts? Um, and I think the floor is open to anyone who'd like to respond. Well, I'll I'm take sure. a step. Yes, please, uh, Gail, go ahead. I was just to start, I think we don't have the luxury of an either or conversation on this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Amer the United States system of federalism and the way in which racial hierarchy has been embedded in our state structures. Uh, I mean, it's always been both and in terms of the federal government has been a, a vehicle for the division that we have. And so we have to figure out a very creative way to do both and and to do it simultaneously. Uh, the resources of the federal government, have, they, they help to make, to, to create this hierarchy. They help to maintain this injustice. Those resources have to be used to help to undo it in all those systems that you were describing. Uh, and so I think it's a both and, and that's why we're excited to, we have a network of maybe 50 or more local efforts that are going on right now, but we want to leverage the, the, the strength of the federal government to be part of the work in partnership, but not to direct the local, because you know racism shows up in your backyard. And so we really have to make sure the local communities are leading the change within their own geographic areas. Pablo, you had some thoughts. Yeah, so which uh, aligned perfectly with uh, what Gail just uh, said. Uh, one of the dangers uh, of the very rapid uh, success of transitional justice is that as every field that becomes formalized very rapidly, it becomes a bit formulaic as well. And the question ceases to be what is the most effective way of satisfying the rights of victims to truth, justice, reparations, and non-recurrence. And it becomes rather the more technocratic question of what's the best way of establishing a truth commission or a prosecutorial mechanism or a reparations program. And in Gail's and Rob's answers, I find a wonderful and absolutely admirable departure from transitional justice orthodoxy, animated by the spirit, you not know, the spirit of both the need to look back in order to be able to move forwards, but without the technocratic obsession of so shall we do a truth commission? Should it be local or should it be national? There are different instruments. I think that it is very important for transitional justice if it's going to be effective to respond to local needs and to the contextual factors that determine whether people are going to be satisfied with the outcome of a particular effort or not. And in a country like this one, which, as you said, Beth, is very large, very diverse, I think that the, the relations between different groups, and not just between whites and African-Americans, but also, for example, there's a huge issue about uh, relations with the Hispanics and Mexican-Americans in the southern border. But given the diversity and given the specific history and given some of the cultural particularities, this is not uh, a confessional uh, country in the same way as, for example, other Catholic uh, countries might be. I think it is absolutely essential for us, not simply to try to reproduce a model, but to craft solutions that start with the white community listening, because we have not done that nearly enough. 
So to put ourselves now in the position of providing the technical solution is, from my standpoint, totally inappropriate. We have to learn the lessons that the, uh, we can gather from vast international experience, but two of the most important ones have to do with context sensitivity and with participation rather than with the replication. Any other remarks before we? Uh, yes. Uh, so, great. Sorry. Rather yeah. than Galu. Please, so, um, okay. <laughs> so, I believe that it has to be a both end approach. Um, the federal government is like the most culpable party when it comes to slavery and a, and a whole host of systemic issues. And at the end of the day, they, they have the funding to uh, finance the, the, uh, you know, the repairment of the damages that, that have been done. Um, but the local governments, they can go ahead and start the process. They can start uh, small communities of truth and reconciliation. They can start the assessment of the damages that were done. They can start uh, immediately by uh, stopping the harm that is continuously uh, going on through policies that are currently implemented that, uh, you know, that, that separate us and, and, and divide us. And so I believe it has to be a both end. I mean, like, for instance, I'll take one situation. We, ha we have urban renewal, which was a national federal program that caused a large scale displacement. And if you look within transitional justice, you know, one of the things to uh, counteract the large scale displacement is the allocation of, of land and, you know, monies to develop that land. Uh, cities and counties, most cities and counties have in their possession still a nice percentage of the land taken by urban renewal and they have plenty of, of other uh, land. But if, if in all honesty, uh, a city and county budget combined could not equal what really needs to be invested uh, to repair all the damages that were done and all the damages that were lost. And that is where, like I said, the federal government is definitely the culpable party to throw in their resources to help address some situations. Um, and I believe that they can't just necessarily give us a check and say, oh, we're sorry. I think we've got to look at each harm that was caused and uh, identify how to stop it from continuing um, and then uh, how to address the situation. And urban renewal is, is just one of those. You know, you have the, the federal, the FHA and the discriminatory policies that they presented. You have uh, you have so many different policies that uh, that hindered us from you know from liberty, which you know was supposedly guaranteed to us within the Constitution. And so the federal government, I believe, is is probably the most culpable party. But our local governments uh, have plenty of things that they can and should do, and also uh, should provide our federal government with the political capital to uh, to be able to move forward. Um, by starting and implementing certain things and in encouraging and calling on the federal government to provide assistance in many different uh, areas. Lou, your perspective. Yeah, just to add, um, I do think small is beautiful, local is beautiful. That's where you have to grow the roots for your social movements for change. Um, and then, but then it will get blocked if there's not also a national policy or a national um, effort looking at the same issue. So it is that dialogue, it is that local, national, local, national. Um, and, um, you know, for us, I just wanted to add that in, in Indonesia, we, one of the things that are, one of the uh, skeletons in our closet is a, uh, a massacre that happened in 1965, where more than 1 million people who were considered communists were murdered um, by the military regime that was in power for, for decades. And for us, we're still not able to talk about it because of this huge fear of communism. And it's like a fear that's been in, you know, passed down generations. Um, and whenever there's any discussion on creating a national dialogue on what happened in 1965, sort of the people who are asleep, the military, the fundamentalist religious get up and do whatever they can to block that process. So. Um, the fear is, I think, similar in your situation where 
There are people who have been mobilized in the last administration to be so scared of this uh, kind of racial, this call for racial justice. And, and you really need to think about how you're going to address that. And the local uh, processes, local dialogue is a really good way to, to start that. But it can only be at a local level, obviously, because the issues are so much bigger. And, and then I wanted to say, also remember that, you know, slavery, colonialism, it's even, you know, it is, it's all across the world and we're still struggling with that. And, you know, that kind of solidarity building, bridge building is really so important for, for us to be able to maintain momentum in our social movements. So as Pablo mentioned, reparations are often a key aspect of a transitional justice response by a state. And it's also a key initiative at the national level here in the United States. Congress is considering HR 40, which would create a commission to study and develop proposals for reparations. Now, as Gail noted, it's a commission. It's not actually um, reparations per se, but nonetheless, it's moving the ball forward. And um, an interesting development is that Human Rights Watch has now launched a major campaign pushing for HR 40, which I think reveals that the idea of reparations is now part of the mainstream human rights discourse. Um, we often think about reparations as being about individual payments to survivors and victims, but the international human rights bodies have been quite creative, and I'm thinking in particular of the, of the work of the inter-American system, has been quite creative in conceptualizing um, and implementing collective or symbolic reparations. And I wonder whether panelists have thoughts on what sort of models of reparations might be considered in these circumstances um, from the level of individualized to more collective to sort of cash, hard cash to more symbolic. Um, and the floor is open. Mm. All right, maybe I'll, I'll just start. Um, I think um, in terms of our experience in Asia when it's only payment for cash and no acknowledgement and no um, symbolic apology, then it means very little and it can, it can be little the suffering of the victims. And I think similarly, uh, I think if you look at the example of like the Cam Cambodian hybrid court um, looking at the crimes under the Khmer Rouge, they're only um, providing symbolic and moral, what they call moral reparations. It's such an important part of it because if it's only cash, then it, it becomes so much, um, it, it, it loses its meaning. Um, and the other point I wanted to say is that it's, it is really important that there is a process around um, acknowledgement and truth telling so that the mainstream society uh, is understands why you're doing this. It's not another thing that they're going to um, reject or say, you know, why, why, why do this, they, that they would embrace this economic correction. And that's really the challenge. Um, if you if you go down the route of like, financial reparations. Thank you. Others? Gail? Yeah. I would just, I appreciate everything that you said. And, and we thought about all of this and looked at all of this in the design of our TRHT effort. Uh, we really do think it's important that the reparations are part of a transformation of our country. Uh, it's not enough to attempt to just pay for the past if you're gonna continue the systematic oppression and denial of opportunity. So again, that's why we say transformation uh, so many of the, the efforts at reconciliation around the world have stopped there, even with reparations, but the systems of oppression have not been transformed. And in order to transform systems within an established democracy, you have to have the public will. Rob kept using the word re, we, and, uh, and I was struck by the need to say, and who is the we, right? <laughs> if we don't expand that, those circles of engagement in this work so that the we is the majority of the society, you know, in an established democracy, and that's one of the, the differences, you know, between the areas where transitional justice has been so well developed, we have centuries of what we call an established democracy, which has with, with embedded and entrenched permission to deny the humanity of wide swaths of the society. And so our work has to be as much about 
the transformation of perception and relatedness and ideas and transformation of systems so that the reparations are, tr are, are true. The reparations are, are, are honest. And, and it's a, you know, it's a long term. It's not a short fix. As, as you said, Rob, it's not a check. You know, uh, it is the transformation of, I mean, it, it will involve checks, I'm sure. I mean, this is a monetary, this is a monetary issue, an economic issue. But if we don't do the, the other work of transforming this society, uh, then it's only going to add to the division. And quite honestly, it, it could be more, it could be a problem as far as the state we're in right now, as January 6th evidenced. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I fully agree. And yeah, I love the way you explain what we uh, consist of. And, you know, you got to really look at what was done to us to understand how to repair it. And once you do that, like, it has to be widespread education. Like, this stuff isn't being taught in high schools and, you know, I wasn't taught what redlining was in high school. I didn't know what a food desert was in high school. I was not familiar with discrimination within the Federal Housing Act. I, I was completely unaware of how we had been disenfranchised uh, on, on an economic level. And, you know, I was unaware of what urban renewal actually was. I knew it was when the government came and paid individuals for land. That's the narrative that I was taught, right? But then whenever I study it, it's like this was a strategic plan. First, they divested from these communities and redlined them so that the appraisal value would drop dramatically. And then once it was uh, classified as, as, as degraded, they came and they gave these low appraisal rates and forced individuals to sell it, saying, hey, you can't take care of this. I'm going to come and take it from you. And no, you don't have an option not to sell. And like, whenever you change the narrative on that, and that's just one instance, like there are so many different things that were implemented um, on people of color within the United States that the broader community just do, does not know. And uh, like, I'm, I, I attend a Racial Equity Institute uh, training. And what always happens is like, it's, it's like being hit with a water hose of information where they talk about, the groundwater uh, issues, uh, which is racism and classism, right? The, a lot of white people come and they learn this stuff for the first time. And like, it's a lot of crying. Like they didn't, they didn't know this stuff. They're like, wow, I didn't know this happened. And that changes the narrative. That, that, that shows people that what we're asking for is not uh, charity, but justice. And so, you know, I, I, I think that it is, it is very important that the, that the first step is educating the broader community on the true history of the United States so that we have this buy-in, we have this massive amount of buy-in to where people aren't saying, oh, I work hard or I, I grew up poor and this, that, and the third, why should, why do they deserve it? And it's like, okay, yeah, that is true. We understand that, that uh, poverty affects other people than people of color, but these things weren't implemented on you systematically and strategically like they were done to us. And that's what we're trying to address and correct. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. No, just if I may, uh, this uh, bit of the conversation illustrates why it is so important to think about uh, these uh, different initiatives in relationship uh, to one another. This is not uh, the same thing as uh, reparations. In this case, it's not uh, the same thing as a program in economic development, for example, or a big infrastructure uh, project. This is a question of justice. Mm -hmm. It's a question of justice for violations that are specific, that were targeted to groups, groups that were composed of individuals that suffered particular harms, and the acknowledgement of all of these and the accumulated consequences of these is an integral part of reparations. Uh, otherwise, this is going to be not just meaningless in some sense, but it will create a backlash that will be very, very difficult to manage. We need to convince people that the fundamental idea about this is the idea of justice 
and that within the legal system, the fundamental operationalization of justice has to do with the satisfaction of rights. So this is not a question of solidarity. It's not a question of charity. It is a question of rights. But that needs to be, in order to achieve that, you need to complement the reparations program with a truth-telling program and with massive, massive institutional reforms. I think that education and reforms to the legal system, not just the criminal legal system, but for example, the absolutely horrendous gerrymandering of the electoral system has a huge impact on this. So in the end, the changing narrative that Gail introduced us to, I think is of fundamental importance. And in a circle of lawyers, uh, as this conversation is part of a meeting mostly of lawyers, the idea of American exceptionalism, including the idea of the exceptional nature of the American constitutional experiment needs to be reassessed. Mm -hmm. There is a lot in the history of American constitutionalism and of subsequent legal practice that needs to be revised in my opinion. Thank you, Rob, you had a quick point. Uh, yes, just real quick, I wanted to also add that I, I really feel like people, you know, part of education is the harms that were caused, but the other part of that is realizing that the solutions benefit everybody. Like for instance, mm -hmm. if you decrease the wealth gap from black and white people, gross domestic product increases $8 trillion a year. So if you take this $15 trillion invested in that gross domestic GDP increases $8 trillion a year. If you uh, interrupt the, the cradle to a prison pipeline, you create a safer community for all people. You know, you, you, uh, you get rid of the policies that, that block out uh, people of color, business owners from, you know, from engaging in business and destroying our economic floor and economic mobility, it produces more jobs and a better industry for everybody. It's like these same things that, that are harming us is really harming everybody. It, it would make our nation a better place. All, you know, <laughs> the totality of it, if we stop doing what we're currently doing. And yes, that's Ooh, all I, I just want, I was about to say the same thing. There's a new best-selling book out that just came out a week ago called The Sum of Us. And it, it details the cost of racism to the whole country and the value that will be added when we eliminate racism. Because I think in addition to the American exceptionalism, you know, mythology, there is also a tremendous sort of ingrained selfishness. And it's important to frame this work, not just helping the perceived other, but it, it has to be framed in a way that it is in our collective interest as a country. It's essential to the viability of our exceptional democracy that we think we have, you know? So I highly recommend that we also frame this work in a way that, again, engages uh, the critical mass of people that are needed in order to sustain the systems transformation that are gonna be necessary. Okay, and if I may, Beth, may I make one short uh, remark uh, in addition? Because I think that the economic case is uh, crucially important, and it is particularly important for people who have suffered the brunt of centuries of discrimination. But in addition to the economic case, I think that there is also a very important moral, cultural, and a psychological case that to be, to consider ourselves a, a fellow members of a shared political project, while at the same time it is absolutely indispensable for African American parents to have the conversation with their children. And for the rest of us to say that this is an acceptable state of affairs, given the intergenerational consequences that this has, not just for African-Americans, but also for the white majority. 
James Baldwin was fond of saying that he felt pity for whites for mm -hmm. the terror that they lived under because of their racism. And I think that there is a lot of terror in the majority that is expressed in the hyper uh, criminalization of social relations in the country, in the absolutely obscene rates of incarceration, in very low rates of trust. All of us suffer from this. And we suffer not just economically, we suffer morally and culturally uh, in addition to the economic costs uh, of this. That's a terrific um, bridge to what I think probably will be our last question given the time. Um, early truth commissions were really designed as a forum for victims and survivors to bear witness. Perpetrators were sometimes named by the truth commission themselves and they were often given a right of reply, but the focus was really on the survivors and the, the causes and consequences of violence. South Africa innovated with their TRC, their Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and created a space for perpetrators and others who played a role in upholding apartheid and who committed violence under apartheid to speak and to potentially um, receive amnesty in exchange for being fully truthful in their role um, during the apartheid era. We saw in Timor-Leste the inclusion of community service for perpetrators to help rebuild the infrastructure of the society that was so destroyed during the post-referendum violence. I'm wondering if we could think a little bit about what role uh, individuals who have themselves been involved in perpetuating systems of um, racial discrimination, racial exclusion, racial violence, et cetera, might be built into a transitional justice response in the United States. And I could imagine the whole gamut of reformed white supremacists, people who were the descendants of slaveholders and who have benefited over the generations from that inherited wealth to police that have been involved in racial profiling or racial violence. How can we build a space for those individuals to be involved in any transitional justice response? I'll take a stab. I, I want to, to be clear that um, the the, the goal is transformation of the broader society. And um, I, I want to reiterate Pablo's uh, warning that we not be technocratic and try to have a recipe or a formula for this. Uh, so in that sense, I think the question is, what is the, the healing and, and rehabilitative strategy that is necessary for 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 many iterations or many aspects of engagement in oppression and racism. Uh, and those answers are emerging. Uh, we have the, form, the descendants of enslaved people and the descendants of slave owners coming together to talk to each other and to figure out how do they go forward? You know, how do they make amends? How do they build a, a relationship that's based on equal humanity? You know, we have perpetrators or former uh, Nazis and, and white nationalists uh, creating organizations to help people reform from that space, you know? So the thing about America is it is so diverse and so big, and we have probably the most, uh, uh, the largest nonprofit community-based uh, segment, if you will, in the world. And so there is so much that is happening on the ground already. Uh, we have to figure out how do we sort of weave this together? You know, how do we create a, a nerve center that 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 is aware of what's going on and that amplifies what's going on so that we can accelerate it, the work? So I, I would just be cautious in terms of not putting labels on what is still evolving as an understanding. Very helpful. Thank you. Other thoughts? Maybe other yeah. models that are out there that people are aware of? Yeah, you know, in uh, South Africa, and this is a micro level example, but I think that the Gail's uh, large point about how to figuring out mechanisms to weave in uh, different local initiatives seems to me to be absolutely right. But a micro level example that I was going to mention was in uh, South Africa. Uh, books were established and the possibility was established for citizens to give commentary on the public hearings that they listened to. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously this was meant largely for the white population to express uh, their views. 
And this is an underexamined aspect of the South African experiment, because in fact, a good number of the entries were entries of people that said, I was not fully aware of the conditions under which uh, the black population was forced in my name to live. And there was a very explicit uh, sense of recognition and acknowledgement in a way that was perfectly safe and that I think started processes of reflection that are always difficult to begin with, but that one should look for outlets and safe spaces for people to start. And I think, again, that if we can find different ways of allowing people in the majority community to express its terror, its fears, its shame also, its sense of culpability, we would be aiding the process of conversation and of healing instead of designing just mechanisms of shaming, for example, which in a country like this, I think will be an immediate turn off. Final remarks, Kalu or Rob? Uh, Rob, uh, go ahead. To, just to add, um, because you mentioned Timor-Leste, I mean, I think the determining factor in that context is that there was a complete political shift and the um, the occupying forces, the Indonesian soldiers were out and, you know, there was a 180 degree change. Um, so, so in a way, I think that so the work that we're doing to, to change, to transform, as Gail said, the mindsets and the hearts of the whole nation in the US would have to be a key part. It's already established to a degree before you can kind of create mechanisms for perpetrators or children of perpetrators or grandchildren to participate in a meaningful way because it has to be based on a voluntary and um, transformative kind of um, process. Thank you, Rob, you have the last word. Yes, um, again, I, I would like to in, encourage uh, people to learn about, you know, the true history of, of what has transpired in America to build up the numbers of supporters uh, so that we can implement transitional justice on large, on a massive scale. And uh, like I said, I feel like the momentum and we've been speaking out for centuries, you know, that's, that's, that's the beginning of the game. To me, I view transitional justice as the middle game and the end game is where we actually have uh, decreased the disparities almost into non-existence. And we are actually living in a just and true society. Uh, we have a long ways to get there. But I think trans the different tools that transitional justice provides uh, gives us a many impetuses to, to pretty much start this process and gives us the framework of where to start these things. Uh, we just have to make a lot of it unique to our own communities and, and get it and get it rolling. But again, like I said, I encourage individuals to, to learn and, and create environments of learning so that we can reach that critical mass that's necessary uh, to, to transition our society into the state that it needs to be in. That's a terrific way to end this panel. Thank you so much for those remarks, everyone. And, and thank you for all of your incredible insights um, and wisdom on this really complicated topic. I would encourage everyone who's watching our panel now um, asynchronously to please press the continue the conversation button. We'd love to continue this live um, in, in a more informal session since we weren't able to do more formal questions for our panelists. But please join me in thanking our panelists and enjoy the rest of the annual meeting.